Welcome to the show. Tonight, the weekend polls and elections, lessons for the Liberals and even tougher news for Labor. The Islamic State attack on a Moscow theatre, a shocking reminder of what Israel's up against and the brutality of Russia's police. But Russia's dictator is pretending Ukraine is involved. Has it got its excuse for even more horror? More violent protests by trans activists in Melbourne and in London, proving their critics are right. Women really are not safe from this new movement. How can a woman's protest in Australia now need this much protection? I'll talk to Irish comedian Graeme Linham in the studio about he, how he's been proved right after his career was destroyed talking about this sort of thing. And journalists also under fire for having spread vile conspiracy theorists about Kate, Princess of Wales, now that she's explained why she hasn't been seen since Christmas. The Kate's absence may be related to her husband and the future King of England, William, having an affair. The tests after the operation found cancer had been present. All that and more tonight. But first... Bruce Pascoe, an uh, almost famous so-called Aborigine, has just upped the stakes with a new book that will really test the cultural elite. Exactly how many lies will these people swallow? So what has fascinated me for years about Pascoe is that he's already proved that our politicians and our academics and our writers' festivals and the ABC, they're going to believe almost any fakery from this fake like his claim to be Aboriginal when his genealogical records show that all his ancestors are of British descent. Or his fake claim in his bestseller Dark Emu that Aborigines before settlement were actually farmers living in houses in towns of a thousand people. Now, as I've proved here repeatedly on the show, it's all complete nonsense. Yet Bruce Pascoe is still a professor at Melbourne University. He's still promoted by the ABC and is still a guest at the next Melbourne Writers' Festival in May because he's just written a new book and now he's really going to go for broke. If our cultural elite will believe all the fantasies so far, I guess he's, fig he's figuring, well, why not try, to try them with even more amazing untruths in his book, which is co-written by his partner, about their farm near Malakuta. It's called Black Duck, A Year at Yambara. Now, this is a book I'm guessing will prove for good that truth is dead to the left. For a start, in this book, Pascoe writes that Aborigines ran this country perfectly for 100,000 years. 100,000 years until whites snatch it away. And to end their disadvantage today, we should develop a truly Australian cuisine based on the old food production techniques of Aborigines and pay them for the produce. He says, I look forward to the day when Australians think nothing of eating roux curry with kangaroo grass bread. In fact, Pasco boasts, and I quote, we actually perform these miracles on his farm. In fact, he's promised this miracle for years. My name's Bruce Pascoe. I'm a writer. I live at Malakuta. And I'm a Ewan Bunurong, Tasmanian man. This is kangaroo grass. The old people work with this to make flour. OK, let me now fact-check these astonishing claims. Now broadcast in his new book and uh, repeated in flattering profiles in the nine newspapers, that kangaroo grass bread is a delicious story. But let's first start with Pascoe's claim that Aborigines were here for 100,000 years, because this also exposes how politicians will say anything as well, any sweet falsehood in Aboriginal history. Activists have, until Pascoe's new boast, uh, said that uh, Aborigines were here for 65,000 years taking quite strange pride in claiming this is the oldest continuous culture on earth. It's as if the rest of the world should be embarrassed that we're losers for having seen the rise of great empires, you know, the Egyptian and the Chinese and the Assyrian and the Athenian and the Roman and the British. And No. Hear it from the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, when he was launching his idiotic campaign for The Voice last year to divide us by race. In recognition of 65,000 years of history. Vote yes, vote yes, 
Yes, on October 14. Well, actually, even 65,000 years of Aboriginal sediment isn't really a fact, let alone Pascoe's 100,000 years. It was long thought that Aborigines were here for no more than 45,000 years, which is a long trot already. I don't know why you need to exaggerate it. Or maybe 50,000 years. Until Professor Chris Clarkson and others claimed in 2017 to have found a hearth at a place in the Northern Territory that showed the occupation of Australia by modern humans out of Africa began around 65,000 years ago. But two papers since, by Professor Emeritus Jim Allen and by nine scientists led by distinguished Professor Emeritus James O'Connell, say they don't believe it. They say there's a myriad of errors in this paper. And any estimate of Aborigines living at this particular site, this one site, for more than 50,000 years is likely, unlikely, to be valid. And no wonder, because they had a lot of questions that needed answering. Why was this 65,000-year-old date confirmed only by testing the, the sand grains around the so-called hearth and not the carbon residue from the fires that had been lit on it? Why does no other site of Aboriginal occupation in this entire country come within 15,000 years of this new date? Just one on its own. What are the odds? And they asked, you know, hadn't these, these papers, hadn't the hearth actually just settled deeper into this very sandy soil, deeper into those older levels that have been dated? You know, sort of sunk down after all the heavy rains from tens of thousands of years of wet seasons up there, plus the borrowing of termites that you find so common up there. So many questions. In fact, though, you see, it's generally accepted that human beings like us and Aborigines, uh, with our telltale genes from interbreeding with Neanderthals, that's how they can track it, we spread across Eurasia from Africa and Southwest Asia only about 50,000 years ago or so. We couldn't have got to Australia. And a group of 18 Aboriginal men even had their DNA treated with or tested with family tree DNA. And they found the common ancestors that lived 65,000 years ago and not in Australia, but probably still in the Horn of Africa. Hadn't quite got here yet. Okay, so that's that 100,000 year claim of Pasco. I mean, you can put that in the, the bin. But let's get to the kangaroo grass spread because this is more fun. And it also goes to Pasco's hip pocket. As I said, he dreams, Pasco dreams in this book of Aborigines finally thriving, even though many do already, let's be honest, in the cities, finally thriving when the rest of us eat truly Australian cuisine and think of nothing of eating kangaroo grass bread. And it's already performing this miracle on his farm. And indeed, he has boasted for years uh, of, of growing this kangaroo grass there, other seeds as well, and making flour, just like Aboriginal farmers allegedly once did. I'm looking forward to that day when I can rock up to Coles and see our, our flowers, our products on the supermarket shelf. Small problem with that dream. In fact, <laughs> it's a huge one. And I don't just mean that the taste of kangaroo grass flour or the pancakes made from it. Uh, I mean, you just check the face of now former ABC chairman Ida Buttrose when Pasco uh, came to cook it for her. Can I try that? What does it taste like? Well, there's the taste test. A bit doughy? No. <laughs> it just tastes right. like flour, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Mm. It tastes like a butter. Yeah. Now, even if you do like the taste of kangaroo grass, and maybe I haven't tasted it, maybe it's terrific, here's the big problem. It costs an absolute bomb to buy because its yields are so low. You need more than 10 times the acreage that you do for wheat. One kilo of wheat flour at Coles, therefore, costs just $1.40, right? $1.40 for a kilo. But one kilo of Pasco's kangaroo and speargrass flour from his farm is $360. Just check his website. Just a quarter of Pasco's flour already costs $90, multiplied by four, $360. And that is despite charities and taxpayers and businesses giving Pasco's farm more than $2 million of help and other kind of advice as well to help stay in business. So you tell me, 
How can that kind of flower be sold as the great solution to Aboriginal disadvantage by PASCO today? I mean, people, check the facts. So we've got totally unbelievable claims of Aborigines being here for 100,000 years, twice as long as some scientists say is actually the time, and a bizarre fantasy about kangaroo grass flour that have worked out will let you bake one loaf of bread for $150. But you watch. Will this latest nonsense finally get PASCO sacked as Melbourne University's Professor of Indigenous Agriculture if this is the nonsense he comes up with? And will the ABC now disown its hero? I mean, here we have PASCO again, testing our cultural elite's commitment to telling the truth. And I'm betting on another fail. I enjoyed that. <laughs> well, last weekend gave both sides of politics a kick in the backside for playing stupid politics. You take Tasmania. You're told the Liberals there won, and indeed they did, maybe the state election on Saturday with Premier Jeremy Rockliffe declaring victory. But what an own goal. Rockliffe actually called this election a year early because his government relied on two ex-Liberal independents who wanted more transparency about his big plan spending plan for a new AFL stadium. But now it's had a big swing against him, around 10%. He's going to rely on probably three Jackie Lambie MPs to form government, and they seem dead against this stadium. But uh, Labor did even worse, can you believe? Less than, oh, about 28% of the vote, 29%, hopeless. Or move over to the by-election South Australia, also on Saturday. There the Liberals managed to lose the seat of Dunstan after former Liberal Premier Stephen Marshall quit there. A swing against the opposition... Unheard of. More than 4%. But then federally, there was a news poll today showing the Albanese government still ahead, but only just after preferences, 51 to 49%. But Labor with a primary vote now of just 32% of voters. That's appalling. So what to make of this mess of figures? Joining me are Michael Kroger, former Victorian Liberal President, Steve Connery, former Labor Senator and Cabinet Minister. Well, Michael Kroger, what do you make? What, what's the big takeout of all these uh, polls and elections? Well, the electorate's disenchanted. Uh, they want politicians who've got ideas. They want politicians who've got vision. They want politicians who've got are prepared to risk their careers on great principles. Uh, what they don't won't, don't want are the you know second-rate policies that a lot of parties seems to be putting up, merely mouth midget policies. They want people who've got vision and ideas. Uh, because people want their best, think that, you know, they want to believe their best days are ahead of them. They look at some of the things being offered and they think, well, that's not going to help me much. So not I'm voting on Labor. I'm, 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 I'm going to vote for the other mob. Yep, yep. What did you make of it? Yeah, no, I think there's there's a little bit both teams can take out of it, but I think yeah. Michael's pretty much on the spot at the moment. The crushing weight of the interest rate rises, the the economic pressure people are under because of the cost of living increases across the board uh, are starting to really bite. And if you're an incumbent, uh, you're starting to feel that. So Rockliffe certainly felt that on the weekend. Albo in that poll. an election with a stupid AD, AFL stadium <laughs> thing. Look, that's, uh, you know, 150,000 uh, people signed up to be members of oh, the new look, Tassie Devils. But, Steve, <laughs> you know there's a joke. All they had to do was pay $10. <laughs> oh, $10. And what, they got some stickers or yeah. something? I mean, who well, wouldn't sign up a fortune well, well, group of people? You think you'd say to the AFL, listen, and it, it, you may, have not a no, may not have noticed, but there's a cost of living crisis, so perhaps we can't spend seven or 800 on the stadium. Could we have the team and use the fill facilities we've got, perhaps upgrade them, but perhaps not seven or 800 million right at the minute. Well, I'm yeah, be fair, it's going to be a billion. There isn't anyone... It'll be a billion. It's It'll be, be a billion. Look, Andrew, people are absolutely skint. People are down to their last $1,000. People are really struggling. I think uh, I don't think... comes a Premier saying we're going to well, build a massive... But, but how, I'm sorry, how ridiculous is that? But right? got the kick the governments, the what governments need to do at a state level, they've got to start reducing the cost of fines and state government taxes and charges, reduce the cost of car registration, do something which is going to have a practical effect on people's cost of living well, I mean, at the minute. But, but of course, I most state governments the, are bankrupt I think their state. I the Herald Sun poll. Well, in Victoria... Pseudo is 
climbing. They can't, the Cerno they, is on fire. They can't do it in Victoria. I just, I just your wish mob of the bankrupted. Party were undermining would stop it. Your mob have bankrupted Victoria, so they can offer no relief here. That's one of the problems in Victoria. Why, did you, why don't you just get behind John Pesuto, Michael, and just, you know, come well, on, say it now. He's a great leader. He'll lead him to the next election. He's up 4% in the polls. Come on, just say that. Come on, yeah, he's doing well. I'm behind John Pesuto. Yeah, everyone's he will behind lead him. He's, to the up four, he's up 4%. Absolutely. But honestly, the whole thing, it's like a midget country out there in, in politics. It's midget country. I mean, when Labor's got a primary vote federally of 32%, mm. I mean, what on earth is going on? I'm not saying the Liberals are doing all that much better, but 32%. No, I mean, clearly the government have not yet gone on top of in the people's minds the cost of living crisis and that they can do more. Now, I saw the Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, he was hinting at relief in the upcoming budget, and I would hope it's substantial, whether it's in energy or whether it's in uh, some other form of payment. Rent relief. Yeah, so all of those sorts of things. I think they, you know, both state yeah, and but federal government. The idea was to wait until closer to the election to do something. Well, the budget, the budget, budget. I, I would agree. If people get, you know, what it's like if people get in in their mind, it's correct, then they wait with the baseball bats. Mm. So I think they've got to be seen to be building more houses, not just having conferences with more other hope. politicians saying, you know, we're going to, we all commit. To, I mean, if we all wait for eight state and territory governments to commit to anything, we're all, you know, in trouble. Mm. Mm. So just get out there and start building houses. Just start yeah, but, doing it. And Michael, <laughs> Steve, there's not the people out there to build them and you will not build them fast enough. I mean, correct. yes, build yeah. houses. How about turn off the tap of the mass immigration? Yeah, I correct. Just, that doesn't I mean, build well, any more houses, though. That's the problem. You can't have... build any more houses. You can't have... Cutting off migration does not build any more houses. Steve, there's a what, shortage right today. Right now, the right people you're bringing in are building houses no, for the people they're bringing I agree. in. Let's pretend yeah. that I... Let's pretend that I... Right let's here pretend I agree with you. But that does not solve... Let's pretend we've done it. That doesn't solve the crisis today. It does nothing other than drive up prices more because we don't have enough labour coming into the country to build them. The one thing, the thing about this is, all right, um, Peter Dutton's popularity is mm. still way below um, Albanese's, mm -hmm. but, it, but Albanese's not that popular himself. The thing is, despite that, he has made the Liberals competitive in a way that... Few people were given money on, put money on, um, what, a year and a half ago? I never take any notice of the t preferred leader poll because that poll is already factored into the two-party preferred vote. And remember this, Andrew, at a federal level. The most important thing is to be respected, not to be liked. I mean, Malcolm Fraser has the biggest electoral victory in Australian history in 1975. And he's, also got, he's also and got the him. second biggest victory in Australian political history in 1977. I knew, Malcolm incre him. I knew Malcolm incredibly well. He's a very close friend of mine for many years. Let me tell you this. Malcolm wasn't all that likable. <laughs> he wasn't an easy person to like, but sure? they respected him. People respected him. Now, look, I, think, uh, I, I think Michael makes a good point, OK? I, I think leadership and strong leadership, it's important. But the thing you've got to disaggregate in the national polls, whether it's the one just out tonight in The Age or it's the news poll this morning, OK, is that the electorate doesn't vote on a countrywide basis. It votes in seats seat in states. Seat. Correct. Yeah. And Correct. in South Australia, what that poll and an actual vote showed that the Liberals could lose a seat. In Queensland the week before, what it showed was Labor are in trouble, possibly in some heartland mm. seats. Mm. And then so you look true. at Tasmania and you go, Jackie Slamby's preferences are going to determine a couple of seats in Tasmania. Mm. But uh, an alliance with Jackie Lambie, I think, with the Liberals, uh, as you've told me before the break, probably lasts less than six months. Steve Conroy and Michael Kroger, thank you both so much Thanks, for your Andrew. time. After the break, Thanks, Russia tortures the Muslim men it claims killed more than 133 people at a Moscow theatre on Friday. And it's President Putin claims Ukraine is involved. Why is he telling such a dangerous lie? Now, you may struggle to feel sympathy for Russians hit by an Islamist terrorist attack on Friday, given Russia has unleashed such terror on Ukraine. But this was shocking. Four Islamic State gunmen on Friday stormed the rock concert in Moscow, killed more than 130 people for the crime of being unbelievers. The Islamic State branch in Afghanistan said its terrorists had attacked a large gathering of Christians. The terrorists also flashed the four-finger salute of Islamists, meaning there is no God but Allah. Now, it's Jews, yes, they're on the, the first in the Islamist queue for destruction. Moscow reminds us Christians are next. Police there claim they arrested the four terrorists 
all supposedly uh, Tajik Muslims, actually, plus several others. They did what the Israelis would be damned everywhere for doing if they did it. They cut off the ear of one, stuffed it in his mouth. I won't show you the video, but this is the guy. Now we spared you the blood there. Others arrested look like they've been tortured as well, including this man who was brought to court in a wheelchair. Some reports suggest that he had an eye missing, another with a badly swollen face, another also bruised and bandaged. Joining me is the country's top foreign affairs writer, Greg Sheridan of the Australian newspaper. Greg, one frightening thing about this attack is that the Russian media was going soft, obviously, on instructions, uh, barely mentioning that this idea that they were, they were um, from the Islamic State or something, going harder on the Ukraine angle with uh, uh, Vladimir Putin, the president, giving national address, suggesting they were fleeing to Ukraine, they were caught and they were implicated somehow. What do you make of all this? Well, Andrew, it's a fascinating and tragic and uh, bloody business. Uh, Putin has a long history of using... Islamist attacks to justify his own strategic moves. I mean, that justified his assault on Chechnya. The uh, Moscow apartment building is being blown up. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I believe this was an Islamic State attack. They've claimed credit for it. Gary Kasparov, the great Russian dissident, thinks that maybe Putin arranged this himself. Um, and uh, I don't think that's true, but it's a fascinating argument. However, the fact that he, he won't say it's an Islamic State attack and is trying to blame it on Ukraine, as if Ukraine would employ four Muslim terrorists to kill uh, Russian civilians in a Moscow theatre. It's the most implausible thing you could imagine. But Putin will, with his total information dominance within Russia, will convince a lot of his people that somehow or other Ukraine had a hand in this and that will... Um, he's now declared that Russia is at war with Ukraine. And um, I think Western irresolution and weakness is giving him hope that he can prevail in Ukraine. Two things about that. But first of all, um, is Putin actually in the clear here uh, in terms of being complicit in that the Americans warned a week or two ago uh, people stay away from crowded venues like exactly this. There's, we fear a terrorist attack. It happened. Putin said, oh, they're just trying to panic us. Uh, no, 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 uh, we don't, uh, we don't, well, that's misinformation. What do you make of that? Well, Putin... And, of course, the, tr the police did not arrive at the venue for an hour. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Andrew. Putin um, was a man formed, grown up and, and uh, created in the KGB. He was a colonel in the KGB. Disinformation, terror, the whole lot. And I think the case is very strong that he has previously staged fake terrorist attacks in order to justify strategic moves. On the balance of the evidence we have so far, but let me hasten to say I don't know, but on the basis of the evidence we have so far, I think it is an Islamic State attack, which he is now ruthlessly exploiting. Now, it's true... No, I just no, mean that he, he was warned it was coming, he did nothing to prevent it, and the police didn't come for an hour. Yeah, the only, the only thing I'd add, I'm, I'm, I'm not ruling that line of thinking out at all, not at all. The only thing I'd add, though, is the Russian ability to have a massive cock-up is, is fantastic, as we saw with the initial invasion of Ukraine. So, you know, the policemen were drunk, no-one was on duty, nobody answered the phone, it's not inconceivable. And then, but then Putin, of course, whether by design or by incompetence, has this mess and he will try to exploit it. I just worry that he could exploit it to do something even worse to Ukraine now, like uh, tell the... Oh, well, you know, nuclear weapons, God knows. Who knows what, what it'll do. Um, one thing this did bring out for me is also a reminder again that this is the sort of thing that Israel is fighting against themselves. Islamist terrorism. We've also seen France undergo the Bataclan theatre attack, Manchester undergo a Manchester arena attack, the same sort of thing. And perhaps we, uh, in the West, people in the West should recall that the is Islamist terrorism is not something Israel can appease any more than any Western country can. The enemy is the same. 
Well, that's absolutely right, Andrew. The, the Islamic State is trying very hard to reconstitute itself in a number of territories, in particular Afghanistan, which is now a very permissive environment for terrorists. It has come in waves. It's come and gone in waves. It tends hideously to say this, but it's true, to get great prestige from these big mass terrorist attacks. I went and had lunch with a couple of Israelis today and they said the, the Hamas attacks in, uh, on October 7, they didn't sound like Palestinian attacks. They sounded like Islamic State attacks. Now, they, they, they believe they were Palestinians, but who have imbibed the culture of Islamic State. And Islamic State wants to spread this ideology of which an extreme sadistic murderous quality is a central part. The violence is part of the ideology. It's not an add-on to, you know, the religion of peace or something. It's part of the ideology. And they will... Now, Russia itself has a lot of trouble with its Muslim minority. It's a big power in Syria. Islamic State is unhappy with what it's doing in Syria. Uh, um, it seems that Russia vetoed a second Syrian front against Israel because it didn't want its own military bases put under threat and it didn't think the Syrian army could fight. Mm -hmm. So there's a big agenda here and I think the terrorists are trying to make a count comeback because like China and Iran and Russia, they've seen a certain weakness in the West. Coming back to the same theme again and again. Absolutely, Greg Sheridan, thank you so much indeed for your Thanks, time. Andrew. After the break, how trans activists in Australia are proving feminists right. They really are a danger to women. Joining me in the studio is comedy, a comedy genius who lost his career saying exactly that kind of thing and nearly got banned from Australia for saying it. Plus, look at all the weasels in the media now saying sorry to the Princess of Wales after she announces she actually has cancer. As you know, I was shocked to see so many commentators and comedians mocking Kate, the Princess of Wales, when she disappeared for a couple of months to deal with what was obviously a medical problem after serious abdominal surgery. And wasn't just British commentators suggesting she was getting divorced, maybe, but also American ones like Stephen Colbert. The kingdom has been all flutter by the seeming disappearance of Kate Middleton. Well, now, internet sleuths are guessing that Kate's absence may be related to her husband and the future King of England, William, having an affair. Then last Friday, Kate explained exactly why she'd been out of sight and humiliated them. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. As you can imagine, this has taken time. It has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment. But most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be OK. And now look at those media vultures flapping back, having to grovel and apologise. Yet still lecturing the rest of us to apologise ourselves to Kate. Joining me from London is Esther Kraku, writer, author, broadcaster and much more. Esther, what do you make of all these suddenly, all these nasty people suddenly acting like they've got a conscience? Oh, sorry. Yes, they didn't think about having a conscience when they were basically bullying a woman in her early 40s that they knew had had a significant medical intervention. And even if it hadn't turned out to be cancer, um, deserved her privacy like she asked for to rest and to prioritise herself and her family. Um, <clears throat> you had people like uh, BBC reporter Sonia McLaughlin, who complained that she was the target of trolls on Twitter, and yet was one of the people that led the conspiracy theory uh, against Kate, that she wasn't even seen at the, that sort of, that farm um, shop in Windsor. I mean, it was completely ludicrous. All these people are hypocrites. All these people like to to, to say that they're, they're feminists. And yet here you have a woman who's been bullied since uh, her early 20s just for, 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 for being with the future king, uh, who's serve this country living in a, in a glass fishbowl that many of us wouldn't choose to, to live in and yet somehow her greatest crime was to, to ask for privacy while she recovers from from surgery and now unfortunately it turns out she's undergoing chemotherapy i mean it's 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 not surprising but it really does show that society has a problem with how they treat women particularly elderly women uh, for some reason women in the royal family are fair game they're, they're it's open season um and you can't no one can make the argument that it was just simple curiosity um, over a Photoshop picture, because oh, even when she on, apologized, no. 
that's when these the cranks and these lunis, uh, conspiracy theorists and this, these uh, lunatics went into overdrive. Uh, so it wasn't just simple curiosity. It was hostile, horrible behavior. It was bullying of a woman. And actually, quite frankly, when I watched that video, I felt really, really sick that I even knew about her or she felt the need to tell us about her cancer diagnosis. And um, one of the reasons why it, apparently she chose to say it then was because she was waiting for her children to go on half term so that they would be at home and that she and William could control at least um, the kinds of information that they were being exposed to as opposed to having children from school uh, gossiping and, and, and feeding them what they saw on Instagram. So it's a really horrible and uncomfortable situation um, all around. I mean, I, I hate to draw parallels, but you know, if, they, if they'd leveled a campaign like this against Meghan Markle, they would have said, oh, it's racism. That's why nobody cares that she's, she's a woman uh, wanting to recover from surgery. It's just horrible. She really didn't deserve this and i'm not surprised that these vultures are coming back to, to start apologizing well i thought she showed such tremendous class over these clickbait monsters because even when as you could see she was clearly distressed very thin and drawn and dealing with a devastating health scare she said this have a listen at this time i'm also thinking of all those whose lives have been affected by cancer for everyone facing this disease in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. I think Kate has bought herself immunity for crit from criticism for years and years to come after this. But suddenly, yes, the, the royal ranks look really thin. You know, you've got the king having cancer, you've got her having cancer, you've got uh, the king apparent, you know, the, uh, the heir apparent, uh, William obviously distracted. Does that bring Prince Harry only fifth in line to the throne back into the picture? Uh, I, I believe I speak on behalf of, of everyone in Britain when I say God forbid. <laughs> um, <it's... laughs> I, I believe clearly um... the prior right now for uh, the Prince of Wales and for Queen Camilla is obviously uh, the King and, and Princess Catherine and making sure that they recover um, as quickly as possible. Um, obviously, you do have other royals that could step in to help. Prince Andrew and the Sussexes are clearly not in that oh, uh, to be included there um and also it would make sense that they're there they would keep their distance from the sussexes because clearly there's a lot of sensitive medical information um that will be shared between them as a family the last thing they need is for harry and his, yeah. his netflix cameras to be uh floating around uh this and this is not a couple that are known for their privacy taking uh, notes so privacy. true so true Esther crack you thank you so much indeed for your time really appreciate it this weekend we saw aggressive and intolerant pro-Palestinian protesters at Sydney's Port Botany. Police arrested 19 of them. There were three more arrested in other Sydney protests for allegedly spraying police with fake blood. And yet more protests against commentator Douglas Murray just giving a speech that was pro-Israel. I mean, why do these protests have so little respect for the rights of others? They have different opinions. But the weekend's dumbest protests were the pro-trans ones. Now... <clears throat> The Let Women Speak movement has said the radical trans movement is a threat to women born women. And the radical trans women movement in Melbourne on Saturday proved them exactly right again by trying to shut down their protests. In London, you saw the same thing when the Royal College of General Practitioners called the Gender Critical Conference and had trans activists trying to burst in. So this is where we've got to in Australia. Women just trying to speak now, need all these police to protect them. Joining me is someone who lost his brilliant career trying to warn of exactly this. Irish comedy writer Graeme Linehan is touring Australia after rehearse, releasing his memoirs, Tough Crowd, about how this man, Linehan, the maker of the Father Ted series, lost his TV career because of his opinions over transgender politics. Well, our federal immigration department even tried to Delay Linhan's visit, delayed it so long that he missed the first week of his tour until we protested here. But it's here tonight. Graeme Linhan, thank you so much for joining me. When you see these protests against the Let Women Speak rally, saying, how dare you say we're dangerous and being so dangerous themselves, what do you think? I mean, there's comedy in that. Well, yeah, although I've kind of long ago stopped laughing at it because it's... Uh, I've, I've had six years now of seeing women being attacked for having 
perfectly normal, perfectly standard feminist opinions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what's worse, uh, the press, uh, who have trans activists installed throughout the media and as, as they are throughout institutions everywhere, uh, casting these women as Nazi adjacent and uh, and so on, you know. So I went to. I, I, I woke up two days ago to women to uh, women being um, threatened in Melbourne, and I went to sleep to doctors being threatened in London. You know, extraordinary. Yeah, doctors who were there, by the way, to talk about uh, evidence-based uh, solutions for people with dysphoria, and they don't like this because they know that once people start scrutinizing these issues. They'll realize that they've been sold uh, a fake bill of goods, you know? It's, it's strange, isn't it? Because it, we're in a place, a weird place, where people like you, uh, where, and, and these doctors even now, where they're the, and, and the politicians here, the female politicians here, who attract the hatred are then blamed for causing it. Like, it's the target of the hatred yeah. that is the villain rather than the mob that's attacking them. How do you explain that? I don't know. I think that, like, the way I see it is that apparently after the invention of the printing press, there was like a few hundred years of pure chaos, because every lunatic with a theory was able to suddenly put it in a book and it gained some authority. Um, I think the similar thing has happened with the internet. Insane ideas have started to take hold, and they've sped uh, with a kind of... Um, speed of a contagious disease throughout society. You know what I think might be happening, Graham? That the thing, society's pretty good, and you've got a class of people, though, that want to see things deeper than you, they want to seem smarter than you, so they have to invent something that's so incredible, so impossible possible to believe, that only their own caste does, only their own group does, and you are cast into the outer darkness yeah. for believing the truth. Yeah, exactly. It's I mean, tribal. I know. It's tribal, and it's... Uh, I think Dave Chappelle said, trans activists win arguments by making up words. And uh, words like cis and cisgender, these words have no traction in the real world. They only have traction among a certain kind of activist. As you've seen from the inquiries into Tavistock, etc., the National Health Service uh, stuff in Britain, uh, that so many people getting treated for so-called I'm in the wrong body actually have other medical mental conditions that might help explain what's really distressing them, like autism, like being from a broken home, like having an absent parent, all these kinds of things. Yeah. Why, why isn't there more objection to this? Again, because they, because you know what happens when, when you object. It's you lose your career, like I did. They came after my family, so I lost my marriage. You know, they do everything they can to stop people from finding out the truth, which is that these these um, procedures are experimental. And, uh, I mean, uh, if I could well, show this... Well, that is, in fact, what that uh, what inquiries in, in Britain found, that... Uh, and we had a uh, psychologist here uh, suggest, say, that... In fact, there's a lack of evidence that this actually works, which is why yeah. it's off the uh, National Health Service in Britain. Yeah, it's been reversed. Like to, uh, the Tavistock whistleblowers said, uh, they used to. There used to be a dark joke where they used to say, "Soon there'll be no gay people left," because all these kids who were feeling kind of different from their friends because they were gay, they were given the explanation, "No, you're actually trans." That you is know? so true. It's incredibly it's so tragic. tragic. And a lot of them have lost their sexual function. A lot of them are sterile, you know, and no one is telling these kids. Now, Graham, I, I get the feeling now that the tide has changed. You've had these decisions in Britain to stop treatment of uh, children uh, through the National Health Service. Uh, you're getting a lot of whistleblowers coming up. There's that report there that came out two weeks ago in America. Yeah, this is something... Michael Schellenberger and others uh, documenting the problems. BBC, I just want to say, this has been out now two, since the 5th of March, and the BBC has not reported on it once. And it is a shocking collection of, uh, of uh, whistleblower documents from inside WPATH. You so, know. I think the tide is turning. Do you see the day when all your fans from comedy will see you back in that line of work rather than this? Well, I hope so. I mean, uh, I, I've actually started working on something that uh, obviously I can't tell anyone what it is or where it's appearing, but things are looking good in that direction. So um, Father Ted the Musical again. 
Uh, no, they've. I, I think the producers of that are hoping I'll die, you know, <laughs> because because they don't. They and they, you know, I I spent three years working on that, and Hattrick Productions are just sitting on it and letting it rot, you know, and destroying my relationships with the other my other colleagues, you know. So I've given up on it, to be honest. Um, but you know, I'm just going to keep going and I'm going to keep writing. And uh, the book came out and that's been doing quite well. So I'm just going to. Yeah, I, I, I don't see why I should just lie down and, and let them win, you that's know. one thing they haven't killed off yet. That's coming back. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Your fans here will be very pleased to hear that because I know you've been doing comedy workshops while you're here. Where can people catch up with you? Uh, I'll be going to uh, Perth, Tasmania, uh, Sydney, uh, Brisbane, um, yeah, all over the place. So and just look up your name on the internet? Yes. Oh, no, I'll tell you what to do. Uh, follow the Free Speech Union Australia on Twitter and get in touch with them. They'll, they'll hey, let you know what's going on. Hey, you in until you do your little plug. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> Lovely to see you and glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely to speak to you. After the break, the new ABC chairman talks tough on ABC bias. It must end. But then I think he spoils it all. Could the party at the ABC finally be over? I mean, in so many ways, as journalists push left-wing politics on global warming against Israel, The Voice last year, need I go on? Well, its new chairman, Kim Williams, former son-in-law of Labor Prime Minister Gough Whitlam, has just said enough. You know, if you don't want to reflect a view that aspires to impartiality, don't work at the ABC. Joining me is the panel, Federal Liberal MP Garth Hamilton, Steve Chavour, a senior lecturer in history at Campion College and co-author of The Forgotten Menzies. Stephen, Williams talks a good game, but then again, he went on the ABC this morning and couldn't actually think of much that the ABC was biased about. That might be the uh, get-out-of-jail card for him, mightn't it? Yeah, and that's not surprising because the left doesn't see themselves as left. They see themselves actually as neutral. And the only way you're going to get the ABC to become in any way neutral, or I would actually just prefer a diversity of different views, is not to simply encourage them to be neutral. That's not going to work. They already think they are. What you've actually got to do is be proactive and actually hire uh, uh, conservative hosts on different shows, make sure that the Q&A panel is evenly balanced with conservatives and non-conservatives. The only way the ABC is going to aspire to any kind of neutrality is if journalists and show hosts and shows hold one another to account, not by simply asking them to be neutral. They already think they're neutral. Gath, uh, I think that's absolutely correct. I think the idea of trying to keep people quiet about their real opinions is a nonsense. They come through with social media, that, that ship's long sail. It is to hire conservatives to balance them. Why has the Liberals, you know, been in government for so long, been so hard put to get the ABC to show that even-handedness in hirings? Look, I think it's a very good question, something that we need to be standing uh, very firm on as to what our intentions are in the future. Uh, one thing for sure, uh, whoever's leading the ABC can't do it on their own. They do need the government behind them. And uh, look, I, I am optimistic. I'd like to be optimistic. I'd like to think of an ABC that returns to its former <laughs> glory. I, I grew up loving the ABC. I think a lot of people did, and there's a lot of goodwill that's still there. I, I don't know how much longer we can hold that out, though, Andrew. Um, but uh, look... I, I, I want to see this succeed. Is this where you start bursting into song that you might you may say that I'm a dreamer, <laughs> but I'm not the only one? Garth, please, please. You've got me. I used to be with Jason and the Argonauts. Uh, I used to be with Jason <laughs> and the Argonauts, but I can see an irredeemable case when it's staring me. Now, Stephen, you work uh, at uh, university. Uh, I've thought for years that standards uh, at our universities are, are dropping. Now there's some hard evidence that's hard to dismiss. dismiss. Academics of Sydney Uni have checked their own uni giving student grades over the years, found massive grade inflation. For instance, fewer than 8% of students got the top mark, a high distinction, in 2011. A decade later, more than 25% did. 22.8% got a distinction in 2011. That's the next highest. A decade later, more than 38% did. And in that time, the failure rate is halved. I mean, what on earth is going on? Either our students are getting much smarter or the academics are handing out top marks like lollies. What do you think it is? 
Uh, they're not getting smarter. Uh, I think there are a few reasons. One of them is that students now are seen as customers who, that, deserve, that universities need to please rather than students who need to learn. And so there's tremendous pressure on lecturers and universities to, in, to make sure students are happy with their grades. Students expect good grades. The other thing is, quite frankly, technology. There are so many uh, online websites that help students to answer questions, to do their assignments and podcasts and things like that, things that didn't exist exist 15 or 20 years ago, so they're getting more help than ever. But unfortunately, to the point where a lot of these websites and apps and all sorts of things are almost doing the essays for them. So no, I don't think the students are getting smarter. I think technology is being used uh, to, the, to the great benefit of students. And the other thing is a lot of universities, I, I find, are getting rid of invigilated exams and, and doing at home take home exams, which give students who oh, do their exams right. at home a great yeah. advantage. And Garth, is this uh, part of the generation of uh, all children must have prizes? It does have a bit of an Oprah Winfrey feel, doesn't it? You know, everyone gets a high distinction. Uh, maybe I should get my marks looked at, uh, Andrew. Uh, get them modernised, <laughs> I, I might go up a level. But you know, at the same time we're talking about this, we've got the government saying that they want to see 80% of Australians uh, get a tertiary education. If you've got to wonder, when we're seeing things like this, what's the value in that? Uh, and why are we putting university uh, outcomes ahead of trade or people just getting in and starting a career and having a go? I'm not sure that this is uh, a ring endorsement of our tertiary education sector. Particularly when you see some of the courses being offered now. Catholic Archbishop of Sydney, Anthony Fisher, he warns are not for the first time. Christianity is under attack, the right of Christians to speak freely, work together for others, harder. Increasingly, they're facing the sack for expressing traditional Christian beliefs. Uh, running of religious institutions is being undermined. And the government even took uh, control of a Catholic uh, hospital in the ACT. What do you make of all this, Stephen? Uh, go to the Human Rights Law Alliance website and they have dozens of documented cases of Australians being discriminated against because of their religious beliefs, particularly Christians. They've got cases of people being disciplined and sacked in the workplace for expressing their Christian views, people being uh, investigated or suspended as doctors for expressing uh, uh, pro-life views, uh, uh, teachers being fired for expressing their Christian views, uh, public attempts to destroy small businesses because the business owners have have Christian views on things like marriage, university students being disciplined, uh, people being denied the right to adopt children because of their Christian views. Uh, it's all documented at the Human Rights Law Alliance website. What this country needs is a robust religious freedom law which protects not just individuals but also institutions like Christian schools, businesses and charities to be able to operate according to their, their own beliefs uh, because there's a huge juggernaut coming along seeking to essentially cleanse the public sphere of Christians who are open about their beliefs and the juggernaut is largely pushed by militant pro-abortion lobbies and also militant pro-LGBT lobbies. Steve, Steve Trevira and, uh, and Garth Hamilton. Garth, I'm sorry we um, uh, truncated uh, panel tonight. We'll uh, get, come back with a longer one next week. Thank you very much to you both. Well, that's it for me tonight, but hang on because Sherry Markson has a big story.